and I had a long, involved sermon that included information on the reign of Herod, the historical background, how, uh, how Herod died, how old was Christ when he was baptized, an intricate timeline, uh, when that was, the triumphal infant uh, infantry. Exactly. The triumphal entry, uh, which is uh, worth six points, and then the extra point is one or two. Uh, the crucifixion, and a guy named Dennis the Dwarf, and I kid you not. Uh, does anybody, is anybody familiar with Dennis the Dwarf? Neither was I before I studied. He has left a huge mark on the world, and his life influences even I mean, billions of people on the planet today. Uh, Dennis the Dwarf, and in, you know, in uh, full disclosure, his name probably meant the small, the lesser, or the humble, but it could be translated from Latin as Dennis the Dwarf. Uh, Dennis the Dwarf thought the world would end in 500 AD. Uh, when it didn't happen, he was a genius. In fact, he was, he was a monk from Eastern Europe, and he was considered one of the most brilliant minds of his time. And he figured out, Dennis the Dwarf, this, I'm not making this up, he figured out when the planets would align because in that day and era, they, they were really influenced by astrology. And so he was trying to think when the planets would align just right, and he came up with 2000 AD. Of course, he didn't call it 2000 AD because they were using the Roman calendar at that time. And he declared 2000 AD is when the world would end. And then he used the old Zodiac thing, because he was a monk, but he was mixing things up, which I wish he hadn't. And uh, he figured out when one era ended and when the next era began, and coinciding with his planets, he said, wow, that must have been when Christ was born, and he made the calendar we use today, Dennis the Dwarf. Uh, so Christ was born in the year 1 AD, because according to our calendar, there was no year zero, which is kind of funny. It just goes one... B.C. and 1 A.D. are kind of the same year, you know, just one's at the beginning, one's at the end of the year. Uh, unfortunately, according to modern scholars in the early Christian church, somehow alignment of planets and the zodiac didn't give him the right date. I don't know how that happened. Uh, but many people believe that the, he missed the birth of Christ by two to six years. So Christ was probably born between 2 B.C. and 6 B.C. and Dennis the Dwarf just missed it. And uh, not only do modern scholars say that, but early Christian church believed that he was born in 2 or 3, uh, probably 2 or 3 B.C., up to 6 B.C., meaning our calendar is off, which is too bad. The good news is, is that once we recognize the calendar is off, we can reconcile the timelines of Christ and Herod the Great. So when atheist tells, tells you Herod the Great died before Christ was born, he can't be in the Bible, tell, tell him about Dennis the Dwarf. And the alignment of planets and the zodiac did not give him the right date. And so there is no discrepancy. Hallelujah. And I, I was going to spend a lot of time on that. And I thought, you know what? Let's just get to the point. And uh, today's message is a pair of kings, not because we're gambling. We're not even gambling on the Super Bowl. But a pair of kings, and we're going to contrast Herod the Great with uh, Jesus Christ. There's this really, also there's this really cool prophecy in Daniel chapter 9, and Rachel has brought this to you before, uh, that many scholars believe tell us exactly when the anointed one, it talks about the anointed one, who is the Messiah, will come after the Persian, uh, Persians order that the temple will re be rebuilt in Jerusalem. The difficulty is there's four different times the Persians declared for the temple to be rebuilt, and when does the anointed one get revealed? Some people say it's at his baptism, some say at the triumphal ent entry, some people say it was at the cross, so there's some discrepancy there. But uh, we have this amazing prophecy in Daniel chapter 9, and if you add the years from maybe 444 B.C. Uh, up until uh, the time of Jesus Christ, it coincides exactly with Jesus Christ. Daniel prophesied the Messiah. After the temple is supposed to be rebuilt, he will come at this time, and wow, it lines up perfectly, which is another really cool thing uh, when we look at the timeline. But again, it's Super Bowl Sunday, so I decided to skip all that. Okay, we've got uh, two kings, and I want us to now to turn to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew 
<clears throat> we've got two tings, kings, uh, and we're introduced to Jesus in chapter 1, and now we meet a new, very different king, Herod the Great. And uh, Herod was uh, great by human measure. Uh, he was a big deal in the, in the Roman Empire. He, he built incredible, he, 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 he commissioned a man-made mountain, and uh, he commissioned a har harbor works, uh, the temple, which was tremendous, would have been one of the wonders of the world at that time. He, was, he had incredible building projects, and he uh, considered himself pretty great. So here we are, Matthew chapter 2. Please read with me in your scriptures. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east, these are, are wise men and uh, people that uh, kind of like the scientists of their day, from the east came to Jerusalem, and we, we don't know how many there were. They bring three gifts, but that doesn't mean necessarily. So it's just a kind of Christmas tradition and myth kind of interposed there. Uh, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed in all Jerusalem with him because King Herod didn't like another king. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them, where is the Messiah to be born? Where's the anointed one, the Savior, supposed to come from? In Bethlehem of, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, are by no means least among the rulers of Judea, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search of the child. As soon as you find him, report to me uh, that I too may go and worship him. Uh, after they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen, and the star they had seen when it rose and went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Isn't that amazing? To travel all those hundreds of miles, you come to a little baby, and you bow down, and you worship, you adore. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night, and left for Egypt, where they stayed until the death of Herod. And so uh, was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under in accordance with the time he had uh, learned from the Magi. And so we see here that, uh, well, Beth Bethlehem probably was a small town, and so all the children in that area were anywhere between probably five and 20 kids, it's estimated. So it wasn't what we think, you know, we hear all the children massacred, we think hundreds and hundreds of ch kids, but this is a a smaller town, but it's still a huge tragedy. I mean, I was just thinking about Sandy Hook and 20-some children there died. That was traumatizing, and this would have been traumatizing too. Uh, Herod chose two years old and older, showing that Jesus was probably born two years prior to that. Uh, then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who are trying to take the child's life are dead. So he got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when they heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And Herod had several sons, and they were ruling in different places at that time. Uh, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee, and went and lived uh, in a town called Nazareth. So it was fulfilled what was said through the prophets, he will be called a Nazarene. So you see a lot and lot of fulfilled prophecy there. And it, of course you can say it was fulfilled intentionally uh, to answer that, but still you're confronted with the fact that all these prophecies, there's only one person in history that ever matched them. So that's at least something to consider about these prophecies. You can 
Um, we've had several billion people who have lived on the planet, and you can not find even one other person who matched all the prophecy revealed in Scripture. In chapter 1, we saw that the King Jesus, King Jesus, King of the universe, knows each star by name, created quasars. If there's multiple dimensions, he's king of all the different parallel universes. Uh, the king who, who thought of the sound of what water would sound like dripping off of which stalactites and stalagmites. Which way they go, quick? Thank you. There we go. And he thought of that sound, of the water pooling where no people are. He, he thought of uh, uh, the way that those, you know, groundhogs and gophers would communicate and look so cute staying on their back legs and how flies would wipe their faces and their eyes. I mean, this is a mighty, mighty king. C incredibly creative to think of all of these different things. And God, king of kings, is born to poor parents in humble circumstances. And he's given the name Jesus, which means he would save his people from their sins. He's given a title, which means God with us. And if anybody says, they say he'll be called Emmanuel, but he's not called Emmanuel in the scriptures, it, said, uh, it says that uh, they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And for 2,000 years, people have been calling him Emmanuel, God with us. So another prophecy fulfilled. So you have God, the greatest possible king, coming to earth in order to be with his people to serve them, by saving them from themselves. Have you ever tried to save somebody from themselves where they're very self-destructive? Everything they do, they're ruining their family life, they're ruining their finances, they're ruining their emo emotional well-being. Everything they do is, is hurtful to themselves, and you're trying to save somebody from hurting themselves. That's what God's doing with us. Sin is that which is opposed to the will of God. Sin is everything nasty and ugly that uh, mars our cells, that kills everything good. And God looks down and he says, Dan, you're struggling with pride. You're st struggling with self-righteousness. Dan, you can throw a pity party like anybody on the planet. Uh, Dan, you, you know, you, got, you get so easily distracted. And God's looking down and saying, you're hurting yourself, and I want to save you from yourself. I want you to turn from darkness to light. And so God is always trying to draw us closer to him. This is the God we have. He came to save us, to save us from ourselves, saving us from our, own, from our own sins. I've had uh, people tell me that it's ridiculous that uh, God would be born as a baby because then God would have poopy diapers. And, uh, and when he gets to be a teenager, he's going to need to start using deodorant. Could that be God? Well, the question is, is there anything sinful about poopy diapers? Why couldn't holy God have anything to do with that? Why couldn't God uh, come and experience life from our perspective? I think there's a big problem when people say, God couldn't have a poopy diaper. Who is running the universe? Because obviously not understanding the Trinity. Or when he was a baby, uh, did God cry? You know, did, did God actually need a heart to pump his blood? There, there's something that's really, really missing the point in all of that. And that's the idea that God, even to remain in heaven and condescend to talk to messed up people like us, is incredible humility already on God's part. What we see in the incarnation is the greatest and most powerful, most wonderful, not like you and me, said, I'm not ashamed to be with these people. I'm not ashamed to come alongside of them, to be one with them. Sometimes we don't want to be seen with some people or we're afraid that that's going to hurt our image. Always worried about image, always worried about, I don't think I'm being respected enough. I don't think I'm being paid attention to enough. God, who is ignored by us all the time. God, who will go to the cross for us. And we don't have time. Don't have time to read my Bible. Don't have time to pray. Too tired to go to church. And God is saying, I love you. Let me save you from yourself. And I'm going to come down next to you. And that's the person of Jesus Christ. 
And then God, the Holy Spirit, comes down to reside with us as we think nasty thoughts and say things we shouldn't say and treat people in a way we shouldn't say. And God is right there. God is humble. And we're on a little speck of a planet circulating an average sun. We're in the corner of the Milky Way on a spiral arm. And there's nothing special about the Milky Way. It's got approximately a trillion stars, and there's approximately a trillion uh, galaxies out there. And we're just a little one dot. We're smaller than a piece of, our planet is smaller than a piece of dust in this room in the size of the universe. And on that little piece of dust, we walk around like we're such big deals because our life is so short. <laughs> And somebody offended me, and my pride is hurt. And I'm going to teach people a lesson. And God, who sees it all, and the Bible says he knows every star by name, God says, I'm going to come. And I love these guys on this little speck, of, this little speck in the universe. I'm going to come down and be born alongside them. So that, yes, it's a miracle. He was born as a baby with poopy diapers. What's an even bigger miracle, the first miracle, the stunning miracle, is that he gives us thought at all. Whoosh! The galaxy is gone. These guys shake their fist at God and say, you can't tell me what to do. He says, I'm going to suffer for you. I'm going to bleed for you because you're my family and you're bigger than you know. The whole universe, I did this so that we could be friends. And he comes, and we have the audacity to say, ha ha, you can't be God because you had a poopy diaper. You say, look at me. I've got scars in my hands because I love you so much. Ha ha. That's all we can do. By contrast, Herod the Great. God of the universe, Herod the Great. A big deal in Jerusalem, an important player in the Roman Empire. Herod is petty. What's so great about Herod? He had ten wives. He's a violent deceiver. He tries to use his power. Everything he does is for his own benefit. He kills and tortures, tortures family members. He took his sons. Well, we're going to get to that. Never mind. Studying for this message, I was blown away how the, Matthew begins this book. The book of Matthew, I never knew how awesome it was. Uh, and it's funny because I've been teaching so many years. But you start with the book of Matthew, and right away in chapter 1, we saw so much information. It continues right into chapter 2. Last week, Matthew, writing to a Jewish audience, he lets us know right off the bat G who Jesus is, who his relationship to Abraham is, his relationship to David, where his part is in the history of Israel. He introduces to us the Holy Spirit because even though the Holy Spirit was shockingly, when we were studying through the Old Testament, we, I was kind of surprised how often the Holy Spirit comes up in the Old Testament. Now in the New Testament times, the Holy Spirit's going to take on this whole bigger dimension. <clears throat> and right away in chapter 1, we're introduced to the Holy Spirit. And he lets us know that the Messiah would be born to save his people from their sins. So you have a sin problem, <coughs> as Brother Chet was talking about. Right away in chapter 1, and what we said last week, imagine that you're the very first century church, your your Jewish congregation, and Matthew the Apostle writes, writes this scroll or, or whatever, and, and you get this book, this codex, and somebody opens it and starts to read. And right away, you see all of this information about, in that context, this is an amazing, amazing accomplishment. And Matthew lets us know that this little baby, this little boy, would be called by people, God with us. Then in, in chapter 2, we see this contrast between two kings who could not be more difficult. And I'm going to read from you from the teacher's commentary. And I could have summarized it all myself, but it just said it so well. I thought, why not just quote from the commentary? Herod the Great was the founder of a dynasty that placed a key role in, played a key role in gospel history. We meet four generations of Herods in the New Testament. He is the founder who ruled from 47 B.C. to about 4 B.C. That's difficult, though, because we think it's 4 B.C. because his son started reigning in 4 B.C., but it's very possible they were doing a co-regency for several years. 
And we know he died at the time of a lunar eclipse, and there was a lunar eclipse in 5 B.C., 4 B.C., and 1 B.C. And so uh, right around that time is when Herod the Great died. Uh, when he died, he was aged, aged nearing the end of his life when we meet him in Matthew chapter 2. Herod's father had attached himself to Julius Caesar's party uh, during a civil war in Rome, been made a Roman citizen and appointed a uh, procurator, uh, ruler of Judea. Herod and his brothers were given government roles, but a decade of battling followed before Herod was proclaimed uh, king of Judea by Rome and was able to enforce his rule. As king, Herod was both brutal and decisive, punishing or executing his enemies and rewarding his friends. Rivals were murdered. When the decisive battle for the Roman Empire was fought between uh, Mark Anthony and Octavian, later be called Augustus, Herod gained the victor's friendship and was given control of additional lands. When Herod's power was growing, his control over himself and his family was slipping. Herod married ten wives and had a number of sons. While these sons schemed to gain the throne, his wives attached, hatched plots and counterplots. Herod became more and more suspicious and paranoid, even torturing his son's friends to discover any plots about his own life. Herod's own character as a plotter who Herod's own character as a plotter who never hesitated to resort to murder was being reproduced in his family, and this led to the aging tyrant's own sense of terror and fear. Herod finally had the two sons of his favorite wife, Miriam, uh, Miriam, uh, I don't know how to say the name, uh, executed by strangulation in the very city where he had married their mother 30 years earlier. Antipater, uh, Herod's oldest son and designated heir, tried to poison his father and was put in chains. When nearly 70 years old, Herod was stricken with an incurable disease. It was at this time, shortly before his death, that Herod heard of wise men who were seeking to worship the newborn king of the Jews. Herod summoned the wise men and made them promise to report the whereabouts of the child so he could go and worship him. The dying man still struggling to grasp the power that had brought him and his family only suspicion, hatred, and death. God warned the wise men to return home another way, and God warned Joseph to flee with the Christ child to Egypt. Herod, realizing that the wise men had returned to the east without reporting to him, had all the children in Bethlehem, two years old and under, killed. It was only a few days before Herod's own death, five days before he expired, Herod had his son Antip Antipater uh, executed. Then he called all the leading Jews of, of his territory to his palace. When they came, he imprisoned them, giving orders that they should be killed. The moment he died, he wanted to ensure that there would be national mourning at his death instead of rejoicing. Thankfully, that order after he died was not fulfilled. So he's dead, so they let the people live. Herod's dream of power and glory had turned into a nightmare. The desperate king struggled to the, la to the last to maintain control over his kingdom long after he had lost control over himself, and so he died. What was so great about Herod? He had a miserable life. He was afraid of his own kids because they were trying to kill him. He killed several of his own children just holding on to power for everything he was worth, holding on, holding on, holding on. As the hateful old man was living his last days in the splendor of a marble palace, a child was born in a stable. There, surrounded by the warmth of the animals which shared his birthplace, Jesus entered our world and became a part of a family so poor that Mary had to offer two doves rather than the prescribed lamb as a sacrifice for her purification. Remember we said, that God calls all people to sacrifice, but if they couldn't afford a lamb, he allowed them to sacrifice a dove. The child would grow up in a small town far from the seat of power. He would become a carpenter to live and labor in obscurity for 30 years. Finally, as a young man, the carpenter from Nazareth would stand on a riverbank to be recognized by John the Baptist as the Lamb of God destined to take away the sin of the world. For three years, Jesus would walk the roads of Palestine teaching and healing. He would raise no army. He would seek no earthly glory. He would ultimately humble himself and accept death at the hands of selfish men who saw him as a threat to their place and their power. And yet, through it all, he would be king, the servant king. Now I want you all to grab a hold of your holy scriptures from the Lord God and turn to Philippians chapter 2. Either General Electric Power Company or Gentiles eat pork chops. We'll get you to Philippians. Uh, what's that? Go eat popcorn. I like that one. 
Philippians 2, 1 through 13. Herod, who held on to his power at the expense of everybody else, Look at the contrast. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, and any common sharing of the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being in the same spirit and of the same mind. By the way, Chet and I didn't uh, plan out to be speaking on same thoughts, but we sure came here. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value yourselves above... Uh, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationship with one another, have the same attitude of mind Christ Jesus had. Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage or something to be grasped or something to be held on to. Rather, he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a human being, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. This is, uh, this is stunning. What God would do. He emptied himself. He gave away his privilege. He gave away his glory. He didn't hold on to it tightly. He gave it away so he could come down to be with us. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that the, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. And if you think about the cross, that's the only sane response. Thank you, God, because I know how messed up I am. Thank you, God, that you love me this much. Thank you, God, I'm not going to keep you away. I'm not going to fight with you anymore. I want to love you. I want to follow you. Your way is so good, and I want to be a part of that. Every name should... Uh, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. This idea is... Uh, kind of foreign to us. I've had people tell me, I, it's funny because I read about people who said they couldn't believe the Bible because God says love your enemies, and now I've met people who say the same thing. It can't be true because what it's asking is too hard. This is really counterintuitive. In our culture, in our world, what do we try to do? We try to amass, well, we like to become popular, we like to get wealth, we like to be able to control our destiny, we, you know, we want to be insured. It's, it's Influence, power, these are all things that, that we try to grab a hold of and hold on to. In Christ, God was giving these things away. It's so strange that the greatest of all would allow himself to be beaten up and spit on and mocked by his own creation. There was something really, 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 really bizarre going on here. This is not like any religion that anybody writes. The one we worship? You know, it's not just today. In the time of the Roman Empire, people mocked Christians for worshiping a crucified king. What kind of king is that? What kind of God is that? God's leading by humility. God's leading by, by love. Humility is a virtue in most cultures. People recognize that a hum that's, it's good to be humble. And it's good to, to humble yourself and prostrate yourself before the chieftain or, or the king or the emperor. It's good to humble ourselves before teachers and parents and, and government officials. People understand this. But it's always like, you should know your place, and I know my place because I'm humble. That's good. Christianity talks about the same thing. But in Christianity, so if, if humility is a virtue in all these other world cultures, who's the most virtuous? Well, the person who kneels before a king. Or, or maybe a, a good king who learns to, to come alongside the people and be with the people. But in Christianity, the most virtuous of all is God. And he doesn't share his glory. And nobody's going to out-humble God. 
God is the most glorious because God's the most humble. And then God says, I want you to be like me. Well, what, we talked about this at uh, Band of Brothers. Uh, what does humility look like? Well, it means being patient. A lot of times, why am I not humble? I can't believe somebody do that to me. Well, that's not humble. That's because of pride. It means not being easily offended. I'm getting offended easily because I've been wounded here. That person didn't treat me with the dignity befitting one such as myself. Uh, what else did we say, guys? Unboastful. Unboastful. Anybody else, Band of Brothers, what else did we say? Quick to forgive. Teachable. Uh, when we have a hard heart, when we're not teachable, when we're inflexible, that's not humility. Anybody else? You don't have to have been there. Anything else? What's a hallmark of humility? <laughs> Serving others. Serving others. Thinking of somebody else is better than yourself. Giving your life away. Not being bitter. Bitterness and grudges come from wounded pride. So not holding on to bitterness, not holding on to grudges, being a good forgiver. All of these things are, all of these things, by the way, are God. The Bible says he's not, uh, he's not quick to anger. He's, he's slow to anger, but he's quick to forgive. And God, master of everything, got down in the muck and the mire of human sin, and he had poopy diapers. And he let people spit on him. And he loved them. Uh, God is much, much more glorious than we are. And unlike any other religion in the world, God shows his glory by incredible humility. And then he calls his people to be like him. So brothers and sisters, let's, you know a church where everybody's working on being humble? It means we're getting less bent out of shape. Every, when we're all working on being humble, we're not holding grudges. We're not, we're not keeping long lists but with other people. Let's really work on this. Let's, let's do the Jesus thing and not the Herod thing. We've got a pair of kings. Which one am I going to play? I want to be more like my heavenly father. How different is my life, my messed up self, from Jesus Christ? And how much do, we have, do I have Herod echoing in my soul? It's easy. We're not a king, so, but we're king of our domain. We're king of the things we control, maybe a workplace, finances, relationships. Hold on tight to my little bit of authority. It's difficult. God calls us to serve one another in love the way he serves. And we see Jesus, the King of Kings, came down to serve us by taking care of our sin problem. The opposite of Herod, who used his authority to gain and bring to himself. And this is God's plan. This is God's plan for every single one of us that are called by his name. Every single one of us that are Christians are supposed to be living out our faith in humility in love, a desire to serve others and build up others and encourage others. Let's just uh, spend a little bit of time right now and uh, talk with God about these things. In the quietness of your own heart, just work it out between uh, you and the Father. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Jamesville Athletic Club.